All right, so as we continue our journey of bouncing back and forth around in the book, we've skipped ahead to chapter 13, so we can start doing some polymorphism and inheritance and things like that. So in the last lecture, we created a Pokemon class, and then we created a fire creature that inherits the Pokemon class. It extends it in the terms of Java which made the Pokemon class the parent class. Java calls it the super class. And then we created another one called Charmander, which extended the fire type. So let's just bop, pop open that code. Let's uh, see if I have it saved as a Word doc. Probably not, huh? We did do it in this cl class. Let's go look. Out in the contents. And we also did a car dealership which demonstrated composition. So our short inheritance example. We're just taking a look again at what we uploaded the last time. So here's our primary class. Not our primary class, our super class. Our what other textbooks would call a parent class. And then here's the fire type, which extends that class. Extends means it gets all the goodies, all the methods and members of that class, and then adds its own stuff. Now, in this case, its own stuff just consisted of a new constructor, which set the type of the Pokemon to fire. And then we created another class called Charmander. And the Charmander class extends the fire type, so it inherits everything that the fire type class has, which inherits everything that the Pokemon class has. So the term superclass, don't let it trick you into thinking that it means that this is more powerful than the others or that it's got more in it. It's actually got less. The class that has the most stuff in it is the one that extends the superclass. And again, this isn't a great example because these things don't have additional attributes. They don't have additional variables or methods that they're adding on to. So that's what we did. And I'm sorry, we're probably not zoomed in far enough for you to see it. There's our super class. It had a name, a number of hit points, a type, and it had a set hit points. And since fire type extends Pokemon, it also has that set hit points type um, method. It could call it if it wanted to because it's part of it. And we did that down here when we actually created a Charmander. We set its hit points to 100. Now, Eve, we did that even though the Charmander class doesn't have a set hit points method. But it extends fire type, which extends Pokemon. And Pokemon does, in fact, have a set hit points method. Let's go back to our lecture. So the benefits of inheritance supposedly helps with code reusability, especially once you start using polymorphism. A superclass's code can be used for multiple subclasses, which can make it easier to debug things, eliminates code redundancy. And the programmer can use an existing class to create a new subclass. You could extend the string class that Java gives you and add some new functionality to it if you wanted to. I'm not sure what, but you could. You can make mod smaller modules because the classes are split into superclasses and subclasses to make debugging and upgrading easier. If you were writing a Pokemon game and there was a problem with the fire type, they just have to check out the firetype.java file and go and look at that class in particular and not necessarily need to look at the Charmander, you know, the ones that inherit from it or the one that it inherits from. Okay, so how we did make all those classes, those would be their own files, right? Right. Each one should have gone in its own file. In my example, I brought shame to my ancestors and did not put them all in their own files just so that we could scroll up and down and look at them. But I did for the composition. I was proud of myself for that. So here we could implement a person superclass with an employee subclass. This is a better example than the Pokemon because the employee class has some extra members. So the person class is going to have a name, it's going to have a constructor, and it's going to have a getName accessor method. The employee class should inherit from it. 
it will extend the person class, but it will have a new member variable called ID. And it will have some constructors and it will have a display field. So they're making it sound like the employee class is going to have a constructor that sets the name of the person and also sets the ID of the person. And lo and behold, we have some code here that's supposed to do that. Almost feel like making us write our own. But anyways, so we have a person class which has a private member called name. It's got a constructor that allows you to construct it and pass in a name. And they also gave it a default constructor so that you can create one and the name is just an empty string. Then they added a getter, an accessor for name. So that's the entirety of our person class. Then we had in a class called employee which extends the person class it inherits from. The C++ syntax for that is not to use the extends keyword it's just to put a colon there but anyways. And it has a new method excuse me a new member go away called ID. So it extends the functionality of the employee class by having something else. And so we have everything that the employee class has but we're giving it our own constructor to set both the name and the ID. And then we have a display method, which we've left empty. Um, so even though everything in our super class, well, besides our methods, like our data is private, it can still, if you make your methods private in your super class, could it inherit those still, or? Good question. Well, Are, if you mark it as private, does it, prevent the inherited objects from getting a hold of it. Let's find out. Which I feel like I kind of just answered my own question because we could set the hit points to, well, no, that was a public method. But, so. Right, we, we call it a public method. So I'm going to go in. We're going to make our own person class and our own employee class. So I'm going to try to do it right. And now that I have my new solution created, my new project, and I remove the package, make the change required so that the package is gone. Now I'm going to go to Projects. Here's my new one. I'm going to right click on Default Package and do New Java Class. This is going to be called Employee. No, it's going to be called Person. And so far, at this point, all our person class has is a name. So inside public class person, public string name. That's enough for now, just to test our theory. Our question is, does mark this private mean that the subclasses, the inherited classes, cannot access it? Now let's go back to our projects and create another one called employee. So again, I'm going to right click on default package, do new Java class. This is going to be employee. And public class employee extends the person class. Now I'm just going to write a silly method that all it does is test to see whether we can get a hold of that name method. Name is equal to Bob, you know, whatever. Is that going to work? And it underlines it. It's an error. Name has a private access. So the answer to that is no. If you mark something private, it really is private. Even your child classes, your subclasses cannot get a hold of it directly. So they would have to use getters and setters. There is another keyword though, protected. If I go back to the person class and make name a protected string rather than a private string. When I go back to employee.java, that error is gone. What's the difference? So private means only methods inside my class right here and now can access that variable. Protected means 
only me and my subclasses can access it. Okay. And there's another one, package. I'm not even sure that's the correct word, but it says it means that only other, no, that's the default. If you don't put public or private on it, then any code that's in your package can get a hold of it, but any code that's outside of that package cannot, which is not true if you mark it as public. All right, so what else does every person in the world have besides a name? Let's go ahead and give them a birthday. But I'm going to go back to making these private. Yeah, age, age. Okay, that's fine. Int, age. And we're going to need setters and getters for all this stuff. Void, set age, parentheses, int age, in parentheses, curly brace, this.age equals age, semicolon, int curly brace. The same for name. Void, set name, string name, in parentheses, curly brace, this dot name is equal to name, in print, in um, semicolon, in curly brace. Sometimes I take the time to line up the setters like that. And let's do some getters as well. So age is an int, so int get age, parentheses in parentheses, curly brace, return this dot age. You saw me skip the this keyword because in this case it's not absolutely necessary, unlike here where we had to use the this keyword, the this reference in order to distinguish between our parameter and our member variable, our instance variable. And then int get name returned this dot name semicolon and curly brace. And again, just for looks, I'm going to tab all this stuff over. And it's not an int; it's a string. Excuse me, string get name parentheses in parentheses. Now, an employee is a person, but he's got some extra information. I was thinking about making it more complicated, and we'd have a salaried employee versus a wage employee, but nah, let's just do an employee, singular. So I'm going to control S to save that. I don't see any red marks anywhere. I'm going to skip back to my employee class now. I'm going to get rid of this test method. I didn't make a constructor for the person class. I noticed that at this point. I may think about that at another point. But what else does an employee have? He has a salary. So double salary, private, double salary. And we need getters and setters for that. I'm going to cheat, highlight salary, choose refactor, encapsulate fields, Click refactor, and there now I have my two getters and setters. Um, but it's always a good idea to know how to do them by hand. And I'm going to move my instance variable up to the top above my methods. If you were wanting to um, make your constructor for a subclass, would you have to call the method like set name? equal to name like in the constructor? Yeah, that's what we're going to try to do is next we're going to make a constructor that sets the name and the age of that person. Let's give that a shot. I'm it's just it's I tend um yeah, you could make a constructor for the person class that allowed you to set that information and then you could invoke that or you can try to call the setters 
but we're not going to be able to change those variables directly because we made them private. So public employee, and let's accept the name of the employee, their age, so string name, int age, double salary, lowercase s. And let's see if we can just call the setters on it. This dot set age is equal to age. This dot set name, when I said equals, that was wrong. This dot set age, parentheses age, semicolon. This dot set name, parentheses name, semicolon. And this dot set salary, which we wouldn't have to do, right? Because salary is right here. We could just change it by hand right there. We could just do this dot salary is equal to salary. I don't have a reason to prefer one or the other. Now we're getting little warnings here. No. Overridable method call and constructor. Click it and it takes you to some weird thing. Yeah. So let's Google up what that means. Because I've always thought that this is a, a perfectly legit thing to do. And yet I'm being told that it's not too cool. So, and I knew this was going to happen as I typed it. Overridable method call and constructor. Let's Google that up. Overridable method call and constructor. And I'm sure it's going to take us to Stack Overflow where somebody has asked this. What's wrong with overridable method calls and constructors? Very good question. NetBeans warns me. Simply put, this is wrong because it unnecessarily opens up possibilities to many bugs. When at override is invoked, the state of the object may be consistent and or incomplete. Now, I particularly don't see how we have any overridable methods going on. So constructors with too many parameters can lead to poor readability and better alternatives exist. All right, we're going to go ahead and shy away from doing it this way. And we're going to call our method set data. So I'm going to change that public employee to public void set data, which is going to set those four bits of information in one fell swoop. And then I'm not going to worry about creating a constructor at this point. We could. We could get this to work. And I think this is where the PowerPoints were, were taking us, is to create a constructor for the person class and have the constructor for the employee class call that super class's constructor. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's add a two string just for fun so we can print this stuff out. public string to string add my little over at override notation so above that I'm going to put at capital o override string s s is equal to string dot format employee name equals percent s age equals percent D, salary equals percent dot two F, and then, then a comma after this close quote, and on the next line, we're going to print out this dot get name, parentheses in parentheses, this dot get age, parentheses in parentheses, and this dot get salary, parentheses in parentheses. Then one final terminating parentheses just to top everything off or to end everything, right way to say it. And then return S on the next line. 
Okay. All right, let's go back to our main method our, in our driver class and create a employee. I'm going to come over here. Employee E1 is equal to new employee. E1 dot set data. We have Joe Bob. Joe Bob is 30 years old and has a salary of 10,000 a year or 10,000 a month or whatever that means. One would be a lot better than the other. Now let's create another employee. Employee E2 is equal to new employee. E2 dot set data. Susan. Susan White, comma, she is 40, and she's earning a little bit more, 12,000 a month, 12,000 a year, whatever. They get well rewarded at this place if that's per month. And let's print them out. System.out.println, E1, and then system.out.println, E2. And it did print them out. Employee name is equal to Joe Bob, age 30, salary is 10,000. Employee name Susan White, age 40, salary is 12,000. Um, I know, I think I asked this question in C++ before. Uh, why would it be um, better to make a two-stream method instead of just having like a print employee method or something like I didn't the question is why put a two string in there rather than a print employee method I think you should have both honestly two string ought to return a primitive employer uh, programmer friendly set of data you know a data dump for the object whereas print employee ought to be pretty printed you know something that the user would want to see okay. and for these I skip the pretty printing and just dump the information out like that so just to show that we can do it, let's go ahead and create an array list of employees. So we're going to need to go up here and do import lowercase java dot lowercase u util dot array list with a capital A and a capital L. And yes, I could have let NetBeans add it by itself. So now down here, array list, angle brace, employee in angle brace, I'm just going to call it A1, is equal to new array list employee. No, I don't even need that one. It, it figures that out automatically. So just angle brace, angle brace, in beginning in parentheses, in parentheses, like that. And let's add those to it. A1 dot add employee E1. A2 dot add employee E2. Oops, excuse me. Our array list is just A1. So A1 dot add E1, A1 dot add E2. Now what are we going to do? I don't know. We could step through them and print out their names. So for employee E in our list, I'm regretting calling it A1. For one thing, that looks like AL. I'm going to change A1 to EMP list. How about that? Employee list. So array list employee space EMP list is equal to a new array list. And then EMP list dot add E1 and then EMP list dot add E2. And now for every employee E in EMP list, let's just print out their name. System dot out dot print line E dot get name. And 
and get name is a method and I forgot my parentheses so it's print line e dot get name parentheses in parentheses and here we get this cute little thing where NetBeans is offering to rewrite this as functional programming and you can take a look at that you can click it and let it do it and then once you shriek in horror you can undo it <laughs> I'm kinda kidding but we don't teach functional programming and if you've never seen it before this looks entirely different you can kinda see it's a for each loop employee list for each e print out e dot get name the syntax is very similar actually but it looks quite different as well undo undo all right there we go we could also create an array list of people because each employee is a person so array list of person I'm going to call it per list for person list is equal to new array list so array list angle braces print parentheses now let's add our employees to the per list per list dot add e1 parentheses semicolon per list dot add e2 in parentheses semicolon now when we step through it we have a little bit of a problem here and our problem is is that all it knows about these employees is the information that's stored in the person class which is okay we could still call get name on it right but we could not get a hold of that employees what did we give extra their salary we can't get their salary out of it because it thinks that it's a person it is a person so let's do this for person P in our pers P E R list so four parentheses person P colon P E R list this time I'm going to use a brace because it's going to be more complicated than just one line of code first let's prove that we can get a hold of their name system dot out dot print line their name e dot get name but P excuse me p dot get name not e but then let's try to get their salary out which we could have done up here right because it was a person we could even prove it we could let's go and modify that first for loop to print out their salary as well just to prove that we can so we're going to change this for employee in imp list brace system dot out dot print line we ought to really use F or maybe just print their E dot get salary parentheses in parentheses plus a space so that there's a space between their salary and their name it could be ugly format but that's okay and then followed by E dot get name now before I print out anything out here I'm just going to comment that out and run it to make sure it works right and then I'll uncomment out this second for loop so here's my first for loop I want to make sure it works one error my instincts were good compile failed I probably just have too many parens or not enough closing braces. Yeah, that's the problem. I don't have enough closing braces. Do I still not have enough closing braces? I apparently have a more serious error than that. Really? All right. I think I have, I really do think I have too many clothes. All right, let's look. I'm scrolling up here. Here's main, and then I'm going to hit shift. Open square brace and it'll take me to the matching one so that's end of main now I need another one for class so I'm going to scroll up here to top and I'm going to hit shift 
open square brace. And that's not expected. Do I have some stuff way under here that I'm not expecting? Yeah, that's what's happened. Look at this. I had some braces down here at the bottom. All right. So end main, and then underneath that is end class. Tabbed out. Now we're all good. I apologize for that. Pause it and fix your braces if you have the same problem as I do. Then run it, and we will see that it printed out the person's salary followed by their name. All well and good. It did that when we used our list of employees. But now we're going to use our list of persons. So I'm going to uncomment out this code. For parentheses person p colon per list, let's try to print out their salary. System dot out dot print line p dot get salary. If you noticed, it didn't even pop up. Get salary is one of the choices for that. And then after that, print out their name. And then after that, do a close brace. And it's just flat out refusing to let us do it. Why? Because this is a person. The person class doesn't have a salary. We have to convince this that it really is an employee. Could you do? No. So you can you, you can do for employee in that list though either. Right, I could not do it for employee. I mean, let's give it a shot, but it's not going to do it. Okay, so what you got to do is you got to cast it. So what we need to do is we need to cast it into an employee. So employee is equal to parentheses employee end parentheses p. And then we could print out e dot salary. So the next line now becomes system dot out dot print line parentheses e dot salary. And we could change the name of it, you know, down here, the next one to be e as well. Although p works because person has a name, but so do employees. But I'm, to be consistent, I'm going to make them like that. This is slightly risky, though, because we may have stored other things in the person list besides employees. What if we created another data type called student, which also inherited from the person list? If you added a student to the person list, but then you tried to cast it as an employee, it would generate an exception. So we ought to put this in an if statement. If, why have I already forgotten the syntax for it? It's instance of. Yeah, so if p dot is, well, that's not doing it. If employee dot is, in, okay, I'm, I'm botching it. It's just p instance of. All right. So if p instance of. Yeah, that's it. Of employee, then brace, go ahead and cast it to an employee, print their salary out. In fact, I'm going to wrap the whole thing up. Okay. So there we go. We have created an array list of employees, and everything worked smoothly, right? We could print things out easily, we didn't have to do any casting. And then we added them to a, an array list of a more generic type, of the superclasses type. And in order to get to those special fields that were part of the subclass, the employee subclass, we had to cast it first. And so to do that safely, we checked to make sure there was an instance of the employee class before we cast it. certain keywords work like how is instance of is it a method is it what what is that like how does it compare well it's yeah the question is is what is instance of and other keywords are they methods and no they're really not 
There are some languages where absolutely everything is implemented as a function, I believe. Logo is one of those, but I, I could be wrong on that, and somebody listening to that may, may laugh at that. They are just keywords. <laughs> uh, so when the compiler runs through it, it generates special code to handle that. It writes out some assembler or, or some byte code to handle it. And so it would go and write the code, like if you do this, like if you do if, you know, 3 is greater than 4. That doesn't mean anything to the computer underneath. But it can write out, if this was C, this is what it would do. It would write out some assembler that would check that to that. And if they were, if this condition was true, it would jump to one chunk of code and run it. Else it would jump to another chunk of instructions and run it. So it gets turned behind the scenes into lower level code. Now Java doesn't go into assembly in Sibler. Instead, it goes into bytecode, you know, the intermediate form. But the idea is the same. So this high-level stuff gets translated into lower-level stuff. And so each keyword generates a block of code. Well, it's technically like an operator. Pardon me? Instance of? Isn't that, isn't that kind of like an operator? No. Well, it takes those two. It's it's options. it's a keyword, just like if and for and while. It kind of looks like an operator. You could probably make an operator that did instance of, if I mean you know, if you're writing your own language. Let's check the Java doc about it. Instance of sh right click show Java doc and it didn't do anything. Alrighty. Remember, it pops up in the uh, output. Oh, it shows up down here in the, in the oh, output close. when you do that? Not this time. Yeah. Can I perform Java, show Java doc here? Oh, fine. Okay. So, instance of from oracle.com, or just instance of Java, that would take it up. So, Java instance of. It is an operator. What do you know? Okay. Score one for Adrian. The Java instance of operators use the test whether the object is an instance of the specified type, the class or the subclass of the interface. It's also known as the type comparison operator. I thought because it wasn't a symbol, it wasn't an operator. But it is. And it returns true or false. Okay. All right. I think that's enough of this. Let's... Uh, All right, so for inheritance, which I completely misspelled there. Isn't that cute? All right, so our inheritance homework. We're going to write a class called bl uh, block. A block is something that has a length, a height, and a width, right? And yeah, we've done this kind of thing before. So we're going to write a block class. And then we're going to write a cube class that extends the block class. Now there's something we should have covered, which is how to call the super constructor for this stuff. So let's go back and hit the PowerPoint for this. You can call a super constructor by doing this. Super arguments. And we'd better illustrate this in our in our next class before I, I mean the class that we just wrote before I ask you to do it in your homework. So let's go back and remember how we had the person class but we didn't have a constructor for it? Let's add a constructor for it. So public, I, what I did is I switched to the person class and I actually, actually like putting my constructor up you know at the top of the methods but I'm going to put it down here. Public person and it's going to take their name, string name, and their age. And inside it, this dot name is equal to name, this dot age is equal to age. And sometimes NetBeans will say, oh, by the way, you could mark this as a final class because you have no way of changing these things. But we actually do have ways of changing these things. And that means it's a little bit too smart sometimes. It analyzes your code. And if you don't have any setters, it suggests that you mark this as a final. 
meaning that you couldn't change it after you allocated it. Okay, so we have a constructor for our person class, right? Yep. Let's go over here into employee and create a constructor for it. Uh -oh. Now, what this is complaining about, if we look, is that it says a constructor is required. That the person class needs a constructor of a string and an int. So we need to make our own constructor here that calls that super constructor. So public employee, and it's going to take their name, string name, it's going to take their age, int age, and it's going to take their salary, double salary. And the first thing it does is it calls the base, the super classes constructor, passing in the name and the age. Then we can set the salary. This dot salary is equal to salary. We know not. We no longer need this set data method anymore. Why? Because the employee constructor does the same thing. I'm going to comment it out. That's going to make us change our client code, our driver code. But I think that's okay. Or why don't we just leave it, but create one more object? create one object one way and create one object the other. All right, I'm not going to comment out set data, but we did add a constructor employee that takes the name, age, and salary. And the first thing it does, and this does have to be the first line in the method. If you moved it down to underneath that, underneath the other line of the constructor, if you moved it down there, it would call it an error. Give us a syntax error. So it does have to be the first line. The invocation of the super classes constructor has to be the first line of your own constructor here. And now we can go back over here. And when we create our constructor, oops, we didn't give a default. We didn't add a default constructor, which would accept no values. So we really have botched our code at this point. But we can fix it. When we create our employee, we pass in their name, Joe Bob, end quote, and their age, 30, and then their salary, which was 10,000. I'm just going to comment out this set data. My instinct to get rid of it was accurate. In fact, I'm going to delete it. I'm going to make the same change to employee.e2. Susan White, comma, she's 40, and she earns 12,000. All right, so we've seen now that you can call your parents class constructor. And if you're writing your own constructors, you need to do that. And we were getting an error trying to set, well, a warning when we were trying to set the properties, the uh, attributes, the instance variables of the person class. Remember when we did name is equal to name, you know, inside the constructor and it said, hey, you shouldn't do that. That's because that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to create a constructor that then calls the superclasses constructor. I suppose then we could turn around and set you know this dot name and whatever after we've done that. But uh, let's not play with that anymore. So let's go back to our homework assignment. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to make a block class that has a length, height, and width. And I'll, I'll pre-format this later. So you're going to have three instance members. And if you remember your UML, I could put minus signs in front of them, you know. Double length, double height, double width. Then we want a cube class that extends the block class. It doesn't add any instance members. Along with our instance members, we want a couple of methods. We want two methods. We want a constructor that allows the programmer, or that takes as parameters, length, height, and width, and a get volume.
that returns you know length times height times width because that's how you calculate the volume of a block. So our cube class, a cube is just a specialized block where length, height, and width are all the same. So it doesn't add any instance variables. And it only has one other thing, which is a constructor. One additional method, a constructor that accepts as a parameter the side length which calls the superclasses constructor to set the length, height, and width of the block to the side length passed in. Then I want you to be able to do something like this. Your driver code is going to look like this. You know, block B is equal to new block, and you know, it's a 10 by 20 by 5 block. You know, and then double volume. I'm going to call it V1. Block B1 is equal to new block, and then double v1 is equal to b1.get volume, right? Then you can print those out. Then make a cube. Cube c1 is equal to new cube. And it's going to be a 10 by 10 by 10 cube. And then double v2 is equal to b2.get volume. And then print that out. So double V1 is equal to get volume. If you enter my data exactly, then 10 times 20 is 200 times 5 is 1,000. So this would be 1,000 if I've done my math right. And then here, when we call get volume, it's a 10 by 10 by 10 cube, which should also 10,000. So our driver code in main. Put each class in its own file. Have the main method in a separate driver class. All right, does that make sense? Yes. You good with that, Kathleen? Yeah. You're kind of going no, but. I'm going to go back and read the chapter and it will be yeah, <laughs> something like that. All right. All right. Now, I usually don't give a composition homework along with the inheritance homework. I could create a UML for this. So a block is a shape that has length, height, and width, right? And then a cube is a shape where the length equals the height equals the width. Maybe I'll make a UML for it. All right, hopefully that's enough. Alrighty, so pretty soon we're going to be getting into interfaces and abstract classes and polymorphism. And that's where these things get more fun. <laughs> the other assignment that we have over classes, which I didn't actually assign, but I'm going to go ahead and do so now if I can find it. my stuff go. Okay. What if I 
done. Okay, this is ridiculous. Sorry about that. I guess I won't assign it right now because I don't understand why I'm not seeing my... All right, found it. So advanced Java programming Dropbox. There's an assignment called Piggy Bank, which didn't have a due date. It shows it being done, due October 16th, but I hadn't actually ever assigned it, so that's not really fair. Some people did do it. Here's the Piggy Bank assignment. It's got a lot of associated information with it. It's just got a, a document and then some hints, if you want the hints. Here's the document. Piggy bank assignment. Write a program that simulates a piggy bank. As you know, a piggy bank is a coin bank shaped like an animal. The program will prompt the user for how many of what type of coins to add and then tell the user how many coins and their total value are in the bank. So the solution needs to have the following classes, a piggy bank class, a coin class, and then a client class with a main method, the driver. So the piggy bank should have as one of its instance variables an array list of coin objects. So it's as a member, it's a private instance variable. Piggy bank needs a method called add, where you specify the number of coins and the coin type that you want to add. So, you know, a penny is worth $0.01, a dime is worth $0.10, a quarter is worth 0.25 or whatever. Then the piggy bank will need methods that show how many coins are in the bank and how much money is in the bank. So the class should not allow the user to put in more than 50 coins into the bank. So here's a UML for the piggy bank class. It's going to have a instance variable called coin list, which is an array list of coins. It's going to have get total money, which adds up all the coins. It's going to have get number of coins, which just returns the length of the array list. And then add coins, where the, the uh, programmer gets to specify how many coins and what type. So you can read the associated documentation about it. Here's an example of it. Enter how many coins is zero to quit. I want to enter five. What kind of coin do you want to add? One for pennies, two for dimes. One, okay. Then five pennies were added to the bank. The bank contains five coins worth $0.05. And you can see that this one only supports pennies and dimes and that you would rather you, you need to go ahead and implement the other coins as well. So read this documentation, then go to the hints document. So you will need a coin class. I give you a hint about how to make a coin class. In fact, I pretty much give you the coin class right there don't feel like doing it, that's fine. And then when you're ready to, in your main, you can create a quarter like this. A coin quarter is equal to new coin and you specify the width. The, uh, not the width, the value of the coin. Hint two, before you make the application fancy and have it prompt, just do a test like this. Coin quarter is equal to new coin, 0.25. Coin dime is equal to new coin, 0.10. Declare your piggy bank, piggy bank is equal to new piggy bank, and then add some coins to it. Bank dot add coins ten comma quarter. Then call get total money and call get number of coins and print it out and make sure it works. Then once you got all that stuff, you're ready to, to make it roll the rest of the way. And then there's some more hints that I, I'll let you read. All right, let's create a Dropbox for the stuff that we've talked about and we are done for the day.